Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, militaries and climate collapse, our guest is Stuart Parkinson. He is Executive Director of Scientists for Global Responsibility. He has been an expert reviewer for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and provided advice to UK negotiators to the UN Climate Change Convention. He spent a year working for Friends of the Earth, coordinating research and policy work, highlighting the link between environmental problems and social injustice. His reports have included the environmental impacts of the UK military sector and Under the Radar, the Carbon Footprint of Europe's Military Sectors. He is also co-author of a book on the Kyoto Protocol and an editor of the Responsible Science Journal. Stuart Parkinson will be speaking at an event in Glasgow, Scotland on November 4th, presenting a petition to the COP26 conference demanding that militaries be included in climate agreements, a petition that you can sign at COP26.info. Stuart Parkinson, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> uh, thank you for all the work you are doing. Uh, why is it that militaries are excluded from climate agreements? Well, basically in 1997, when um, countries were negotiating the Kyoto Protocol, um, which was um, the first legally binding agreement under the Climate Convention, which was agreed at the Earth Summit, you know, in 1992. Um, the the UK delegation specifically um, lobbied for, uh, requested, and got an exemption for any targets and reporting requirements uh, on the military, on on their military and any military in the world. So that was that was kind of the basis. So the legal targets that were agreed. Um, under the Kyoto Protocol, which applied ar- around the year 2010, um, they all excluded the military. And then after that, it's it's been a bit vaguer. And under the Paris Agreement in 2015, um, we simply had, well, the Paris Agreement is a voluntary, the, the targets are voluntary. So countries present their, their um, um, targets for the whole sector, and then the military is part of, can be part of that, or or not, as the countries decide. Um, so some countries yeah. do, the UK does, um, the Americans don't. But um, even when countries do agree to include some of their military carbon emissions, they they tend not to tell you the whole picture. They're they're hidden, or they're. In, they find some way of exempting them. So the picture is very murky. Um, and that's one of the things that our reports, um, the reports over the last uh, year or two that we've been writing, um, we focused on the UK and Europe, um, and other researchers are focused on the US, for example. So, um, and we're trying to get this changed. We would very much like to see military carbon emissions counted, just counted, just measured. That's the first step. And then, then obviously, trying to push yeah. reduce them as far as we can. I, I know you're focused on the UK, Stuart Parkinson. Uh, when the UK was against including them, giving them this waiver at Kyoto, what about all the other countries of the world? Did they have any opinion on the matter? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, it, it was the US pushing for it um, and then the UK, because the UK does, the UK simply followed um, the US's lead and um, and no one really at that stage, really, no one was that bothered about it. They kind of thought, well, actually, you know, we don't want our military emissions counted. Maybe it would that would um, have implications for national security, but they never really thought about it. Um, and actually, when it comes to it now, some countries do count them, like like the UK does. Um, it's the, they realise that publishing data on carbon emissions of the military, and unless you're publishing it on detailed military operations, it doesn't give away any operational data. And so, there's no reason why countries shouldn't be included in in reporting military emissions and reporting all their military emissions, and not just the bits they want to, 
and um, and then having targets on those emissions. And, and how big are militaries as contributors to climate collapse? I mean, how much harder would it be to adhere to climate agreements if they were strictly included? Or, or to put it differently, how much would militarism have to be scaled back? Well, it's because the data is so poor, we only have estimates. Um, and um, we, we've tried to come up with some figures that there are reasonable estimates for the US, um, the UK and various EU countries now, which give you an idea of scale. And, it, and it's several percent of um, national emissions. So it's not it's not the biggest sector, um, but it's not the smallest sector. And it's kind of comparable with maybe civil aviation. Um, so based on the information we know, um, now those figures don't include things like um, the what we call uh, there are two two ways that researchers like me define this is one that one that there's your basic carbon footprint. So that's that's the direct emissions of the military, the emissions of the arms industry, the emissions of extracting the raw materials to create all this these the whole war machine and that's kind of the basic carbon footprint and there you can use similar methodologies for calculating the emissions to civilian to the civilian sectors um then you've got the extra bit which is what happens when you fight a war so when you blow up um um, um fuel depots or um when you destroy forests or when you put people in hospital, you've got to count um, um, all the health care for the, the survivors um, and, and things like that. So that there's a whole extra bit that the methodologies um, are, are rather more murky on. Um, and, and we call the whole of that the carbon boot print. So it's it's much larger and, and more difficult. And, and of course, you know, war zones are difficult places to measure environmental impacts. Um, so yeah. you've got all the, those problems as well. Um, so, yeah, so it's quite murky. But overall, it's probably a few percent. I mean, a few years ago, we, we came up with an estimate of maybe five or six percent. Um, it's really difficult even to be that exact. So we say a few. Is that for the UK or is that that's, an average of nations? That's our estimate for the whole world. For the whole world. Yeah. Uh, obviously, some distinction between Costa Rica or Iceland yeah, or yeah. various countries with little or no militaries yeah. and, say, the United States. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even if even if militarism is not the biggest sector in, in climate destruction in the United States, the United States militarism alone is bigger than the entire climate emissions by numerous other smaller countries, right? Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, it's, um, I, I, to be honest, I can't remember the exact figures for how many countries the U U.S. military is bigger than. I think it might be 140, uh, um, but um, I would encourage people to go and look up at the exact figures on that. But yeah, it's most countries in the world have total emissions smaller than the U.S. military. And that's yeah. that's yeah. Kind of direct emissions. When you start counting the whole carbon footprint, then it's even larger. So, um, yeah. and then you, you, I mean, bear in mind that some of the Western militaries use more fuel efficient technologies. So China, Russia, their, their technologies are, are less fuel efficient. They use more coal um, in, in, you know, um, generating energy for their military bases. So their carbon emissions are proportionately larger again. So, um, but yeah, it, it's, it gets complicated and, and love to be able to give you something more exact, but I can't. But I think this is an important point you just made that most people even paying any attention to this miss mm -hmm. uh, that we're, we see these comparisons, three quarters of the world's countries, their entire greenhouse gas emissions are less than those of the U.S. military. Uh, but that's 
just looking at the U.S. military if it never did anything. Mm. It's you know, yeah, it's yeah. normalizing the war, the yeah. wars, uh, or rather, it's normalizing the military and its preparations for wars and its testing of weapons, and then it's treating the actual wars that it's waging nonstop as some sort of extra freak occurrence that that doesn't get counted in the calculations, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th th this is one of the difficulties, um, and it, and it's also that there's. There's factors which are, you know, researchers will argue about, OK, um, the militaries will help you secure access to oil supplies and other um, fossil fuels. So, you know, the, there's a reason yes. why the US military has a very heavy mili uh, um, presence in the Middle East um, and has good relations with an abusive regime in Saudi Arabia um, and, and Britain as well. Um, so and and those emissions aren't counted. So the emissions of the ships you may be able to the military ships you may be able to count, but but the whole sort of infrastructure creating that relationship and making sure that that um, we maintain our our powerful position in the world. Um, that you, how yeah. do you count that? I mean, where where do you draw the boundaries and, and what I, do you include in that calculation? That's that's really hard. And I, I, I know the majority of this military uh, greenhouse gas emission is, is aviation, uh, but I've seen figures that maybe a third of U.S. military climate pollution is from bases. And several hundred of those bases, if not a thousand or more, are in other people's countries. Uh, and I think the U.S. government would be happy to credit those emissions to the so-called host countries rather than itself, yeah. right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the figures on, on military bases are it, overseas military bases are much murkier. And that, that's a particularly U.S. problem because a few other countries have military bases on the scale that the U.S. does, um, international military yes. bases on the scale the U.S. does. Um, and it, I mean, it, in terms of proportions of emissions, if, if you look at just the direct emissions from the military, they're roughly a third from bases, a third from aviation or at least the US and the UK, a third from aviation, and then a third from other things like warships um, and, um, you know, yeah. and, and et cetera. And then you've, then you've got the arms industry, then you've got the supply chain and the raw materials all on top of that. Right. Um, and then, I mean, there's, yeah. there's other indirect factors as well. For example, aviation, you, you, you burn, um, um, you, you you create carbon emissions in the stratosphere, um, then you multiply those. Then you have to multiply those emissions by two because you get upper atmosphere effects um, when when you um, emit carbon emissions in the upper atmosphere, and that's not included either. And and that's a problem with civil aviation as well as with military aviation. So so you've got all these extra bits, um, and and yeah. they're not being counted. So we so when we see these comparisons between military emissions and how many cars on the millions of cars mm -hmm. on the road for how many years, uh, is that does the figure being used for military emissions really need to be doubled, <laughs> or at least the, the part of it that's coming from the, the, from jet fuel? Yeah, I mean it, it's in our calculation for the UK, um, we did not include this what's called an uplift factor for um, high altitude emissions that would probably yeah. add because because of you're talking about fractions of fractions it would probably add about another 10 percent onto the yeah. uk estimates yeah. then you've got other things i mean some of the gases yeah yeah i mean there, there's so many iterations you go well maybe there's another 10 percent that maybe there's another 10 percent that so yeah it, it kind of adds up and, and this is why we need some decent figures and 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 it's so easy for and without these figures the military can report pretty much what they like and they can point to some figures which back themselves up so the situation in the uk is that the ministry of defense publishes an annual report every year reporting on its activities you know giving its its own particular spin on how good they are it has a sustainability section um, which to many of us is a bit ironic. 
but there you go. Um, it has a sustainability section. In that section, they talk about their carbon emissions, but they only talk about the carbon emissions from their military bases. So, and, and when um, parliamentary questions are asked, um, they will quote that the, the MPs involved, the ministers involved, will quote those figures. And actually, it, unless you dig into the appendix of that report, where they give you all the other figures as well, all the other direct figures, they don't give you the full carbon footprint, let alone the blueprint. But so, yeah. So even when you you talk to any policymakers on this issue, they're quoting the wrong figures, and and yeah. quoting a yeah. tiny yeah. fraction. Typical. And then they say, oh yeah, it, it, it's kind of it, it's fractions of a percent. We don't have to worry about it. And and national security trumps all. And so we don't ask too many questions. Yeah, we we are speaking with Stuart Parkinson, who is executive director of Scientists for Global Responsibility. It's it's interesting how much militaries and military uh, gangs like NATO have started putting out reports on this topic, and they announce that they know climate change exists. That alone is pretty much enough in the United States for everybody to swoon with admiration. And they announce that they want to deal with the problem by militarizing borders and using relief efforts to occupy new territories and so on. But how much are they actually reducing their contribution to climate destruction? Well, it's, again, it's hard without the clear numbers. I mean, there is there are some figures from the US and from the UK that shows that their emissions have reduced over the past couple of decades because of increases in efficiency. But every time there's some sort of major military action, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, it, it goes up um, and so it depends where you measure that reduction from if you measure that reduction from the peak of a war and then you say oh now it's a lot lower then then most of that is because well we put the troops out since then and so while there are a few efficiency gains um, actually long term it, it's it's not that the reductions aren't huge and of course, every time military spending goes up, and we're at NATO's military spending, along with China's, along with um, Russia, well, Russia is less clear, but certainly China's is going up. So, um, so we see the emissions start to increase again. So in Britain, um, we had in 2010, there was a defence review um, after the new Conservative Liberal Democrat government came in. And um, and austerity was put across most areas, imposed across areas, and, and they did include the um, military in that and cut cut some funding, and um, and that you saw the emissions reducing. Now we see emissions starting to increase um, as um, spending is increasing, and and you see over the past two years um, we've seen military emissions increase by about twenty five percent. So this reversal is yeah. being wiped out. And, and Britain has just announced um, last November, about a year ago, Boris Johnson, our beloved prime minister, announced um, the largest increase in military spending um, since the Korean War. So for 70 years. So well, yeah. in the US, <laughs> we're kind of used to some of these crazy figures. In Britain, it's a bit more subdued, but, but that... The scale of that increase just took everyone aback. And this was right in the middle of the pandemic. And think, where are your priorities? Who are you trying to save with this money? Or who are you claiming to save with this money? So, yes. Well, in the U.S., it's it's government corruption first and foremost. It's weapons that the military doesn't even want, that the Congress members want because of who funded their their campaigns. And it seems like the biggest environmental factor uh, for the military and the biggest factor for anything with the military uh, is is budgetary. I mean, it's hard for people to to grasp this, but if you moved ten percent of military spending to activities to act actually aimed at reducing climate destruction that would have a bigger impact than anything else we've mentioned probably mm -hmm. wouldn't it i mean this this is the thing so many schemes are going underfunded or, or not funded at all because of budgetary constraints as they oh it's too expensive to do this but yeah you you look at 10 percent of the military budget and you could claim there's a security benefit from that because climate change 
drives so much insecurity at, at a basic level. Um, uh, it, it, it can drive, uh, you know, natural disaster, that will, not so natural disasters anymore, floods, um, storms, um, crop failures, all those things which destabilize countries, which um, um, cause migration and um, a lot of the things that, that various different political groups um, in the West uh, claim to be concerned about. So um, if, you, if you were to put this money into prevention, into helping to stabilize those countries, helping to reduce emissions so the problem is less anyway, and helping um, to stabilize those countries with, with better aid, more targeted aid, um, then you would be in a much, th there are so many security benefits from that. And much yes. more obvious than spending on the next big weapon. Um, Yes, indeed. All right, all right. Stuart Parkinson, are you in touch now with any negotiators, anyone who's going to be a part of the official COP26 uh, conference? Um, not directly, although we work with other campaigners who are trying to get into the networks. I mean, it, I have been asked um, to input to various um, reviews in the UK about this issue, but they they are only interested in in technical, in technological ways of tackling military carbon emissions. So it's solar panels at military bases or um, more fuel efficiency for, for jets or um, sustainable aviation fuel, what they call sustainable aviation fuel for fighter planes when actually those have all sorts of other environmental problems related to them. So the idea that we should try and negotiate for a, better, a smaller military and, and for countries to do much more to resolve antagonism through negotiation and, and work together to tackle the climate problem, which is a threat that faces us all, and, and use that as a way to reduce our militaries, and divert spending to tackling the big, the really big problem of climate change. That, that's not considered. And, and when you try and make these arguments, um, you know, no, that's not within our remit. But if the UK is already kind of sort of roughly including militaries in its climate reporting and its limitations on climate emissions, why would it be opposed to applying that standard rigorously as an international law to all nations on Earth? I, I think it would. I think it it's. It, yeah, it, I, I can't speak for the UK government, but. But um, my my impression is that the UK is or the UK government and the Ministry of Defence would be quite happy for military emissions to be counted within um, and and legally obliged to be counted within um, the the um, reported um, emissions and the what they call the nationally determined contributions, so the the climate targets. I think they would be okay with that at least. For now, because the percentages are still small, and they can, and and the argument that the argument they always come back to is, well, if it comes down to it, we can just offset it. We can just offset military emissions by growing more trees, or there'll be negative emissions technologies by the time we have to reduce military carbon emissions in um, beyond what we yes. we think we need to in twenty forty or twenty fifty. Um, so, yeah, these these kind of magic technologies which haven't yet been developed or, or very early stage and no idea whether they'll work, whether the costs will be um, extortionate or, or anything else. But that's yes. Well, I don't know that that same solution would work for the United States or China <laughs> or some other places. And I and I suspect that the United States government would tell the UK government to back the heck off and, and, and leave that proposal alone. Uh, but, but let's say that wasn't decisive. Uh, can we find some individuals in the British government? Can we take this petition that's at cop26.info with hundreds of organizations and tens of thousands of individuals and say, here's something you can use. Can you take this to this gathering of, of the world's nations uh, and insist on this change? Or, or is there any government, even governments without militaries or with virtually no militaries, have you heard of a single national government willing to take up this proposal? Not yet, but I mean, there is a potential governments like Costa Rica, 
who, yes, as you rightly said, don't have their own military. There are there are a few other countries, a small handful that don't, and others with um, smaller militaries and a bit more of a progressive thinking. So I, I'm thinking about New Zealand or Switzerland. Um, they 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 could be pursued, and and that's kind of what I'm hoping with our campaign work we will start to, to get through to these governments. I mean, it, it's interesting if you look at some of the governments who have signed the, the new nuclear ban treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We now have, I think it's um, over, we have over 50 countries that have ratified, so brought that treaty into law, and, and then um, 30 or 40 more that have signed it and, and um, are on the going through the ratification process. And I think that yeah. there will be sympathy within those governments that, we should be controlling military missions and, and that should be required within the, the reporting framework and, and the reduction framework. So yeah. I think there are, there are opportunities there, certainly. And I think there are Those people be within, good. within, you know, that you've got to remember the military isn't a homogenous organization where everybody agrees on a, on a single um, particular perspective. There are, there are those who are a bit more sympathetic, who would go, you know, we, we need a military, but we are willing to reform. We are open to some sort of reform. Um, and even those who might actually be open to saying, OK, demilitarization might be uh, one of the ways in which we reduce emissions. So uh, it's kind of finding those people within the organizations, within the powerful organizations, both the military and government ones. Yeah. Well, I encourage people to go to the petition at cop26.info and sign it and spread it around. Um, and uh, we have uh, less than two minutes left. Stuart Parkinson, what percentage of people would you guess have any idea that militaries contribute to climate collapse? And, <laughs> and what percentage have any idea that they're, they've give, been given this waiver from, from climate agreements? There, um, there's virtually no, um, no knowledge of this. I mean, even amongst climate campaigners. They don't, most climate campaigns don't know about this exemption when, when you talk to them. Um, they're kind of not surprised when you do tell them, but, but they didn't, a lot of them just don't realise. Um, yeah. and, and once they do, they don't join in, right? And yes, once I mean, they it, do, they back off. They, this is the difficulty. It's kind of when, when it's such a struggle to get governments to take any sort of, sort of action that is commensurate with the scale of the transition that we need to take to reduce emissions just in the civilian sector. That's hard enough. And a lot of environmental campaigns go, oh, we can't take on the military as well. Um, but if we don't, at some level, we're going to fail. Um, and it might, might not be immediately, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem. And, 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 and this is the thing, part, part of the issue is around if we don't rapidly bring down emissions now then militaries are going to become into more, going to become more powerful because they're going to say well you know the world's falling apart so you, you need us more you need to spend more on us and i think this is what we're starting to hear is that climate change is being used as a reason for increasing military spending and that's completely the wrong approach we need we need it, it is to think about security in a different yeah. way, human security, the UN yes. definitions of human security, protecting people on the ground from pandemics, from storms and floods and all the climate related Indeed. disasters. Indeed. Stuart Parkinson, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.